Hi everyone, welcome back to Pages of the Globe. Today I'm going to be reading to you the short story called The Midnight Zone by Lauren Groff. Now, this is a pretty interesting short story, and it's basically about this mother who's on a spring break vacation with her family at a remote Florida hunting lodge. So there's no internet, no landline, or cell signal, and her husband has to leave for some work thing early, so he's taking the car. And the mother has a concussive fall while her husband is away so she has to cope with keeping herself alert enough to be a mother to her two boys until her husband returns home now motherhood is a challenge for her and she says that while it's true that her children that she loves her children being a mother isn't really her thing and there's also this existential threat of a reported panther so while the panther never comes in the story there is also that constant fear so one of the themes in this story for sure is that everyone can be a mother i mean a lot of people could but not everyone could actually be a mom and you can tell how she has two kids she is a mother but she talks about how it's mostly her husband who does all the things that a parent should be able to do. For example, setting play dates, making food, dinner, all of that is what her husband does. So there's also how the fact how she doesn't want to disappoint her husband because she already owes him so much. And so you also have that hint of not, like, disappointing someone. Now, before I reveal the entire plot of the story, I'm going to tell you a couple facts about the author. Lauren Groff was born on July 23rd, 1978. She's an American novelist and short story writer. She has written four novels and two short story collections. She was a three-time finalist for the National Book Award for Fiction and twice for the Kirkus Prize and was shortlisted for the National Book Critics Circle Prize and the Southern Book Prize and the Los Angeles Times Prize. Her work has been translated in over 30 languages. Groff's first novel, The Monsters of Templeton, was published by Hyperion on February 5, 2008 and debuted on the New York Times bestseller. List. It was very well received by Stephen King, the author. She has written 14 short stories, and in 2017 she was named by Granta Magazine as one of the best of young American novelists of her generation. Midnight Zone itself was published on May 23, 2016. An interesting fact about the author is that her sister, Sarah True, is an Olympic triathlete and she represented the United States in the triathlon 2012, finishing in fourth place, which is pretty high up there. And she was also the winner of the 2007 ITU Aquathon World Championships. Without further ado, let's get on to the story. Remember to like, share, subscribe, and comment down below which short story you would like to hear next. The Midnight Zone by Lauren Groff It was an old hunting camp shipwrecked in 20 miles of scrub. Our friend had seen a Florida panther sliding through the trees there a few days earlier. But things had been fraying in our hands, and the camp was free and silent. So I walked through the resistance of my cautious husband and my small boys, who had wanted hermit crabs and kites and wakeboards and sand for spring break. Instead, they got ancient sinkholes filled with ferns, potential death by cats. One thing I liked was how the screens at night pulsed with the tender bellies of lizards. Even in the sleeping bag with my smaller son, the golden one, the March chill seemed to blow through my bones. 
I loved eating, but I'd lost so much weight by then that I carried myself delicately, as if I'd gone translucent. There was sparse electricity from a gas-powered generator and no internet, and you had to climb out through the window in the loft and stand on the roof to get a cell signal. On the third day, the boys were asleep, and I dimmed the lanterns when my husband went up and out, and I heard him stepping on the metal roof, a giant brother to the raccoons that woke us thumping around up there like burglars. Then my husband stopped moving and stood still for so long I forgot where he was. When he came down the ladder from the loft, his face had blanched. Who died, I said lightly, because if anyone was going to die, it was going to be us, our skulls popping in the jaws of an endangered cat. It turned out to be a bad joke because someone had actually died. That morning in one of my husband's apartment buildings, a fifth floor occupant had killed herself, maybe on purpose, with aspirin and vodka in a bathtub. Floors four, three, two were away somewhere with beaches and alcoholic smoothies, and the first floor had discovered the problem only when the water of death had seeped into the carpet. My husband had to leave. He just fired one handyman, and the other was on his own Caribbean adventure eating buffet food to the sound of cruise ship Calypso. Let's pack, my husband said. But my rebelliousness at the time was like a sticky fog rolling through my body and never burning off. There was no sun inside, and so I said the boys and I would stay. He looked at me as if I were crazy and asked how we'd manage with no car. I asked if he thought he'd married an incompetent woman, which cut to the bone because a source of our problems was that, in fact, he had. For years at a time, I was only good at the things that interested me, and since all that interested me was my work and my children, the rest of life had sort of inched away. And while it's true that my children were endlessly fascinating, two petri dishes, growing human cultures, being a mother never had been and all that seemed assigned by default of gender. I would not do because it felt insulting. I would not buy clothes, I would not make dinner, I would not keep schedules, I would not make playdates, never, ever. Motherhood meant for me that I would take the boys on month-long adventures to Europe, teach them to blast off rockets, to swim for glory. I taught them how to read, but they could make their own lunches. I would hug them as long as they wanted to be hugged, but that was just being human. My husband had to be the one to make up for the depths of my lack. It is exhausting living in debt that increases every day, but that you have no intention of repaying. Two days, he promised. Two days and he'd be back by noon on the third. He bent to kiss me, but I gave him my cheek and rolled over when the headlights blazed, then dwindled on the wall. In the banishing of the engine, the night grew bold, the wind was making low, inhuman muttering in the pines, and inspired the animals let loose in call and response. Everything kept me alert until shortly before dawn when I slept for a mu when I slept for a few minutes until the puppy whined and woke me. My older son was crying because he'd thrown off his sleeping bag in the night and was cold but too sleepy to fix the situation. I made scrambled eggs with a vengeful amount of butter and cheddar, also cocoa with an inch of marshmallow thinking I would stupefy my children with calories, but the calories only made them stronger. Our friend had treated the perimeter of the clearing with panther deterrent, some kind of synthetic super predator urine, and we felt safish near the cabin. We ran foot races until the dog went wild and leapt up and bit my children's arms with their puppy teeth. And the boys screamed with pain and frustration and showed me the pink stripes on their skin. I scolded the puppy harshly and she crept off to the porch to watch us with her chin on her paws. The boys and I played soccer. We rocked in the hammock. We watched the circling red-shouldered hawks. I made my older son read Alice's Adventures in Wonderland to the little one, which was a disaster. 
a book so punny and Victorian for modern children. We had lunch, then the older boy tried to make fire by rubbing sticks together, the little brother attending solemnly, and they spent the rest of the day constructing a hunt, a hut out of branches. Then dinner, singing songs, a bath in the galvanized steel horse trough someone had converted to a cold water tub, picking ticks and chiggers off with tweezers, and that was it for the first day. There had been a weight on us as we played outside. Not as if something were actually watching us, but because of the possibility that something could be watching when we were so far away from humanity and all that Florida waste. The second day should have been like the first. I doubled down on the calories adding pancakes to breakfast and succeeded in making the boys lie in pensive digestion out in the hammock for a little while before they ricketed off the trees. But in the afternoon, the one light bulb sizzled out. The cabin was all dark wood and I couldn't see the patterns on the dishes I was washing. I found a new bulb in a closet, dragged over a stool from the bar area, and made the older boy hold the spinning seat as I climbed aboard. The old bulb was hot, and I was passing it from hand to hand, holding the new bulb under my arm, when the puppy leapt up at my older son's face. He let go of the stool to whack at her, and I did a quarter spin, then fell and hit the floor with my head, and then surely I blacked out. After a while, I opened my eyes. Two children were looking down at me. They were pale and familiar, one fair, one dark, one small, one big. Mommy, the little boy said, through water. I turned my head and threw up on the floor. The bigger boy dragged a puppy who was snuffling my face out the door. I knew very little except I was in pain and that I shouldn't move. The older boy bent over me, then lifted an intact light bulb from my armpit triumphantly. I, a chicken, the bulb, an egg. The smaller boy had a wet paper towel in his hand, and he was patting my cheeks. The pulpy smell made me ill again. I closed my eyes and felt the dabbing on my forehead, on my neck, around my mouth. The small child's voice was high. He was singing a song. I started to cry with my eyes closed, and the tears went hot across my temples and into my ears. Mommy, the older boy, the solemn dark one, screamed, and when I opened my eyes, both of the children were crying, and that was how I knew they were mine. Just let me rest here a minute, I said. They took my hands. I could feel the hot hands of my children, which was good. I moved my toes, then my feet. I turned my head back and forth. My neck worked, though fireworks went off in the corners of my eyes. I can walk to town, the older boy was saying, though waiting to his brother, but the nearest town was 20 miles away. Safety was 20 miles away, and there was a panther between us and there. But also possibly terrible men, sinkholes, alligators, the end of the world? There was no landline, no umbilical cord, and small boys using cell phones would easily fall off such a slick-pitched metal roof. But what if she's all of a sudden dead, and I'm all of a sudden alone, the little boy was saying. Okay, I'm sitting up now, I said. The puppy was howling at the door. I lifted my body onto my elbows. Gingerly, I sat. The cabin dipped and spun, and I vomited again. The big boy ran out and came back with a broom to clean up. No, I said. I am always too hard on him. This beautiful child who is so brilliant, who has no logic at all. Sweetness, I said, and couldn't stop crying because I called him Sweetness instead of his name, which I couldn't remember. Just then, I took five or six deep breaths. Thank you, I said in a calmer voice. Just throw a bunch of paper towels on it and drag the rug over it to keep the dog off. The little one did so methodically, which was not his style. He has always been adept at cheerfully watching other people work for him. 
The bigger boy tried to get me to drink water, because this is what we do in our family, in lieu of applying band-aids, which I refuse to buy, because they are just flesh-colored landfill. Then the little boy screamed, because he'd moved around me and seen the bloody back of my head, and then dabbed at the cut with a paper towel that he had previously dabbed at my pukey mouth. The paper towel disintegrated in his hands. He crawled into my lap and put his face on my stomach. The bigger boy held something cold on my wound, which I discovered later to be a beer can from the fridge. They were quiet like this for a very long time. The boy's names came back to me, at first dancing coyly out of reach. When I seized them in my hands, mine, I'd been a soccer player in high school, a speedy, aggressive midfielder, and head trauma was an old friend. I remembered this constant lability from one concussive visit to the emergency room. The confusion and the sense of doom were also familiar. I had a flash of my mother sitting beside my bed for an entire night, shaking me awake whenever I tried to fall asleep. And I now wanted my mother, not in her diminished current state, brittle, Retiree, but as she had been when I was young, a small person but gigantic, a person who had blocked out the sun. I sent the little boy to get a roll of dusty duct tape, the bigger boy to get gauze for my toiletry kit, and when they wandered back, I duct taped the gauze to my head, already mourning my long hair, which had been my most expensive pet. I inched myself across the room to the bed and climbed up, despite the sparklers behind my eyes. The boys let the forlorn puppy in, and when they opened the door, they also let the night in, because my fall had taken hours from their lives. It was only then, when the night entered, that I understood the depth of time we had yet to face. I had the boys bring me the lanterns, and then a can opener, and the tuna and the beans, which I opened slowly, because it is not easy supine and we made a game out of eating though the thought of eating anything gave me the chills the older boy brought over mason jars of milk i let my children finish the entire half gallon of ice cream which my husband's his one daily reward for being kind and good but by this point the man deserved our disloyalty because he was not there it had started raining at first a gentle thrumming on the metal roof I tried to tell my children a cautionary tale about a little girl who fell into a well and had to wait a week until the firefighters could figure out a way to rescue her, something that maybe took place back in the dimness of my childhood, but the story was either too abstract for them or I wasn't making much sense, and they didn't seem to grasp my need for them to stay in the cabin, to not go anywhere. The very worst happened, the unthinkable that I was skirting, like a pit that opened just in front of each sentence I was about to utter. They kept asking me if this girl got lots of toys when she made it out of the well. This was so against my point that I said out of spite, unfortunately, no, she did not. I made the boys keep me awake with stories. The younger one was into a British television show about marine life which the older one maintained was babyish until I pretended not to believe what they were telling me. They, then they both told me about cookie-cutter sharks who bore perfect round holes in whales, as if their mouths were cookie-cutters. They told me about a fish called the Humuhumu Nuku Nuku Apuaha, a beautiful name that I couldn't say correctly, even though they sang it to me, over and over, laughing to the tune of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. They told me about the walking catfish, which can stay out of the water for days and days, meandering about in the mud. They told me about the sunlight, the twilight, and the midnight zones, the three depths of water, where there is transparent light, then a murky, darkish light, and then no light at all. They told me about the world pool, in which one currently goes one way and another goes another way, and where they meet, and where they make a tornado of air which stretches, and my little one said from the midnight zone, where the fish are blind, all the way up, 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 to the birds. I had begun shaking very hard, 
which my children le- I had begun shaking very hard, which my sh- I had begun shaking very hard, which my ch- children I'd begun shaking very hard, which my children suddenly gentlemen didn't mention. They piled all the sleeping bags and blankets they could find on me, and then climbed under and fell asleep without bathing or toothbrushing or getting out of their dirty clothes, which anyway they'd sweated through within an hour. The dog did not get dinner, but she did not whine about it, and though she wasn't allowed to, she came up on the bed and slept with her head on my older son's stomach, because he was her favorite, being the biggest puppy of all. Now I had only myself to sit vigil with me, though it was still early, nine or ten at night. I had a European novel on the nightstand that filled me with dimness and fret, so I tried read. So I tried to read Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, but it was incomprehensible with my string, which was incomprehensible with my scrambled brains. Then I looked at a hunting magazine, which made me remember the Florida panther. I hadn't truly forgotten about it, but could manage only few tears at night, and others, when my children had been awake, were more urgent. We had seen some scat in the woods on a walk three days earlier, an enormous scat, either a bear or the panthers, but certainly a giant predator's. The danger had been abstract until we saw this bodily proof of existence, and my husband and I led the children home, singing around, all four of us holding hands, and we let the dog off the leash to circle us joyously, because as small as she was, it was bred in her bones that in the face of peril she would sacrifice herself first. The rain increased until it was deafening, and still my sweaty children slept. The rain increased until it was deafening, and still my sweaty children slept. I thought of the waves of sleep rushing through their brains, washing out the tiny, unimportant floatsome of today so that their tomorrows so that tomorrow's heavier truths could wash in. There was a nice solidity to the rains pounding on the roof, as if the noise were a barrier that nothing could enter. A stay against the looming night. I tried to bring back the poems of my youth, and could not remember more than a few floating lines which I put together into a strange, sad poem. Blake and Dickinson and Frost and Milton and Sexton, a tag sail poem in a clammy meter that nonetheless came alive and held my hand for a little while. Then the rain diminished until all that was left were scattered clicks from the drops falling from the pines. And then the rain diminished until all that was left were scattered clicks that went from the drops falling from the pines. The batteries of one lantern went out, and the light from the remaining lantern was sparse and thwarted. I could hardly see my hand or the shadow it made on the wall when I held it up. The lantern was my sister. At any moment, it, too, could go dark. I feasted my eyes on the cabin, which in the oncoming black had turned into a place made of gold, but the shadows seemed too thick now, fizzy at the edges, and they moved when I shifted my eyes away from them. It felt safer to look at the cheeks of my sleeping children, creamy as cheeses. It was elegiac, that last hour of, that last hour or so of light and I tried to push my love for my sons into them where their bodies were touching my own skin. The wind rose again and it had personality. It was in a sharpish, meanish mood. It rubbed itself against the little cabin and played at the corners and broke sticks off the trees and tossed them at the roof so they jiggled down like creatures with strange scrabbling claws. The wind rustled its endless body against the door. 
everything depended on my staying still but the skin but my skin was stuffed with itches something terrible in me the darkness something terrible in me the darkest thing wanted to slam my own head back against the hard wanted to slam my own head back against the headboard i imagined it over and over the sharp backwards crack and the wash and spill of peace i counted slow breaths and was not calm by 200 i counted to a thousand the lantern flicked itself out and the dark poured itself in the moon rose in the skylight and backed itself across the black when it was gone i was alone again i felt the disassociation a physical shifting as if the best of me were detaching from my body and sitting down a few feet distant it was a great relief for a few moments there was a sense of mutual watching a wait for something definitive though nothing definitive came and then the bodiless me stood and circled the cabin the dog moved and gave a soft whine through her nose although she remained asleep the floors were cool underfoot my head brushed the beams though they were ten feet up. When my body and those of my two sons lay together was a black and pulsing mass, a hole of light. I passed outside. The path was pale dirt and filled with sand spur and was cold and wet after the rain. The great drops from the tree branches left a pine taste in me. The forest was not dark, because darkness had nothing to do with the forest. The forest is made up of life, of light. But the trees moved with the wind, and subtle creatures. I wasn't in any single place. I was with the raccoons of the rooftop, who were now fiddling with the bicycle lock on the garbage can at the end of the road, with the red-shouldered hawk chicks breathing alone in the nest, with the armadillo forcing its armored shell until it returns hungrily now. I could smell the worms tracing their new paths under the pine needles and the mold breathing out new spores, shaken alive by the rain. I was vigilant, moving softly in the underbrush, and the palmetto's nails scraped my body. The cabin was not visible, but it was present, a sore at my side, a feeling of density and airlessness. I couldn't go away from it. I couldn't return. I could only circle the cabin and circle it. With each circle, a terrible, stinging anguish built in me, and I had to move faster and faster, each pass bringing up ever more wildness. What had been built to seem so solid was fragile in the face of time, because time is impassive, more animal than human. Time would not care if you fell out of it. It would continue on without you. It cannot see you. It has always been blind to the human, and the things we do to starve it off. The taximonies, the cleansing, the arranging, the ordering. Even this cabin, with its perfectly considered angles, its veins of pipes and wires, was barely more stable than the rake marks we'd made in the dust that morning, which time had already scrubbed away. The self in the woods ran and ran, but the running couldn't hold off the slow shift. A slow, a low mist rose from the ground and gradually came clearer. The first birds sent their questions into the chilly air. The sky developed its blue. The sun emerged. The drawing back was gradual. My older son opened his brown eyes and saw me sitting above him. You look terrible, he said, patting my face, and my hearing was only half underwater now. My head ached, so I kept my mouth shut and I smiled with my eyes, and he paddled off to the kitchen and came back with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, with a set of Uno cards, with cold coffee 
from yesterday's pot for the low and constant thunder of my headache. With the dog whom he'd let out and then fed all by himself. I watched him. He gleamed. My little son woke, but didn't get up as if his face was attached to my shoulder by the skin. He was rubbing one unbloodied lock of my hair on his lips, the way he did after he nursed when he was a baby. My boys were not unhappy. I was usually preoccupied. I was a usually preoccupied mother, short with them, busy working until I burst into fun, then went back to my hole of work. Now I could only sit with them, talk to them. I could not even read. They were gentle with me, reminded me of a golden retriever I'd grown up with. A dog with a mouth so soft she would go down to the lake and steal ducklings and hold them intact with her tongue for hours until we noticed her sitting there unusually erect in the corner looking sly. My boys were like their father. They would one day be men who would take care of the people they loved. I closed my eyes as the boys played game after game after game of Uno. Noon arrived, noon left, and my husband did not come. At one point, something passed across the woods, outside like a shudder, and a hush fell over everything. And the boys and the dog all looked at me, and their faces were like pale birds taking flight. But my hearing had mercilessly, mercilessly. But my hearing had mercifully shut off whatever had occasioned such swift terror over all creatures, save me. When we heard the car from afar at four in the afternoon, the boys jumped up. They burst out of the cabin, leaving the door wide open to the blazing light, which hurt my eyes. I heard his father's voice, then his footsteps, and he was running, and behind him the boys were running, and the dog was running. Here were my husband's feet on the dirt drive. Here were his feet heavy on the porch. For half a breath, I would have vanished myself. I was everything we had fretted about, this passive queen of chaos with her bloody duct tape crown. My husband filled the door. He is a man born to fill doors. I shut my eyes. When I opened them, he was enormous. He, when I opened them, he was enormous above me. In his face was a thing that made me go quiet inside, made a long, slow sizzle creep up my arms from fingertips because the thing I read in his face was the worst. It was fear, and it was vast. It was elemental like the wind itself. The cold sun I would soon feel on the silk of my pelt. The End